In our study of process control and our analysis of how systems evolve with respect to changes or perturbations in uh, parameters in our system or input variables, uh, we are mainly dealing with four types of systems. And the first system that uh, first system type that we are interested in are is called first order. And first order systems have response graphs that look like this. So the y-axis will denote our output variable, and this could be temperature or composition um, or any other state variable that is dependent on time. And the x-axis will be our uh, independent variable time. And so when we an, are lo looking at a first order system, we'll typically see dynamics that look like this. So um, we'll have nothing until our step change occurs at some time. And uh, and then we will realize some kind of change in our output. And so what we'll note is we've reached some kind of new steady state value. So this was our initial steady state value, and we have deviated from it, but we have reached a new steady state uh, value. Okay, and uh, the second type of uh, system that we'll commonly come across, and it is not a good type of system, it is integrating behavior. And integrating behavior uh, is very bad to observe in practice, especially if you're running some kind of chemical plant, because we have no bounds on our system. And so when the change is applied to our system, we can get um, unbounded behavior in um, our model and in practice. And so uh, an example of this would be if a valve failed or some kind of valve was cranked wide open and there was accumulation occurring in your system example the pressure would be uh, increasing um, unboundedly and eventually we would realize some kind of catastrophe and explosion of some sort and so integrating behavior is stuff to be avoided but it is a type of behavior that we see in practice the next type of systems system that we commonly come across uh, is referred to as under damped systems and in these types of systems, uh, they are second order, and we realize oscillatory behavior. And so what I mean by that is if we start at some steady state value, our system will increase or decrease and then um, oscillate about a new steady state point. And so it looks, if I could draw dashed lines, something like this. So we've got new steady state values. It is bounded, um, but there are oscillations. And this is typically seen when we have uh, process controllers in a system. We've got some kind of feedback. And so we modify an input, our output changes. We modify our input again to correct for that change. And we just enter this kind of uh, oscillatory behavior that continues sometimes indefinitely depending on the damping coefficient that we'll get to later. And then the final type of uh, system that we see is referred to as non-minimum uh, phase dynamics. And the key uh, characteristic of these is a inverse initial response. And uh, what we see with those is when we expect to have positive gain, we will initially have, sorry, a negative gain followed by the uh, realization of the new steady state and in the case when we want or are expecting to see a uh, negative shift or gain um, we uh, actually realize a positive inverse or positive change in our output and an example of this would be distillation columns when we are changing the reboiler duty and we have spillover in our plates at the bottom which can cause uh, the fluid level to rise and fluid level in that case would be the state variable that would go here uh, and um, so that's the, the these are the main types of systems that we analyze in process control classes and uh, to recap also the purpose of transfer functions transfer functions the main reason we cared about them so much is because it allows us to uh, quickly compare different inputs to our systems and how they would change because there are different types of inputs uh, that we can have. We 
have most commonly dealt with input um, step inputs in which there's a sudden change and I'll get to that um, but there are different types and the nice thing about transfer functions is that we can quickly analyze our system uh, with a new input type the other reason we care about transfer functions is that it allows us to avoid resolving our ODEs um, when we have changes in uh, our input, for example. And uh, this saves computational time and money. And finally, uh, the last reason we care about uh, transfer functions is it allows us to generalize dynamic behavior and observe what type of uh, these four cases I've just introduced uh, we should expect uh, in our transfer function. And so to get to the actual input types that we have in process control, uh, the first thing we have is the one we're most familiar with. It is the step input. And step inputs are characterized by a sudden change and it's also a permanent change of magnitude m in one of your inputs. And so, for example, if we had some kind of mixer and we immediately changed the concentration in one of the two input inlet streams to a new concentration, the step input would be the magnitude of that change, the new concentration minus the old concentration in the stream you're changing, and uh, that change would be indefinite. And so uh, the way we model this in uh, the frequency domain is like this. So we have our variable u of s, and that will be equivalent to the magnitude of the change over s. And uh, when we look at the graphs of our input over time, uh, we'd have some kind of step time at which the step change occurs and our uh, graph will immediately jump to that new value uh, like so. And it also is important to note, so with these transfer functions we were discussing, they have the general form g of s is equivalent to y of s over u of s. And so we would take in these uh, step inputs that I'm talking about, this u of s function, and then plug it into the, or multiply g of s by it to obtain how your output is varying over time. And so the next type of input that uh, we'll come across is referred to as the ramp input. And ramp inputs uh, have time domain uh, functions that look like this. So u of t will be equivalent to a of t, or a times t, sorry. And uh, this occurs at the step time, which usually we'll call it zero. Um, and that occurs at when t is greater than or equal to zero or whenever your step time is, or input change time. And in the frequency domain, they have values u of s is equivalent to a over s squared, and that is simply just taking the Laplace transform um, of uh, a times t. And uh, visualizing what ramp inputs typically look like, we have graphs that look like this. So we'll have uh, a function like this with a slope of a, and uh, this is our frequency domain. And so next we have our uh, pulse input is another type. And so the thing with pulse inputs is they are sudden, like step inputs, but also brief. And so what I mean by that is if we analyzed a pulse, if anyone's familiar with pulse with modulation, um, we get these kinds of pulses in our input and uh, it would have a value, we typically call it h, and I'll redefine my time axis to be t equals zero at this point, and tw at this point. And in the uh, time domain, u of t is equivalent to h when 
zero is less than t is less than uh, tw. And in the frequency domain, when we take the Laplace transform of that, we find that u of s is equal to h over s times 1 minus the exponent of minus tw times s. And so um, if we wanted to analyze how our transfer function will depend on a pulse input, we would plug this value into uh, g of s up here like so, and we would be able to analyze how um, our system, our output, one of our state variables would vary based on this type of input. And the last, or one of the uh, last input types we'll consider are referred to as sinusoidal inputs. And these are common in process controllers when we are continuously varying the uh, input to reach some kind of set point value. And these sinusoidal inputs have uh, time domains u of t is equal to a the amplitude of the input times sine omega t and t is greater than or equal to zero or whenever we have applied our step change or um, our change to our system and in the frequency domain u of s is equivalent to a omega over s squared plus omega squared and finally uh, the last type of input we'll consider is referred to as an impulse input. And impulse inputs are instantaneous. They are short, extremely short, and they are transient. And they are so short that they are described in the time domain as Dirac delta functions. And Dirac delta functions, as we'll recall, if you took quantum mechanics or some other math course, are functions that have, uh, they essentially have no width, but if we integrated them, they would have an area of one in the time domain. And so an example of impulse input, when I see impulse, I think injection. So if we injected dye into a CSTR, for example, and we wanted to uh, actually measure the uh, resonance time in practice, this is how we do it. So we'd inject some kind of UV dye, for instance, and then we would examine how long it took uh, to actually see the dye come out. Although a CSTR would not be a good example, a plug flow reactor or packed bed reactor would be a much better uh, use of the injection because in a CSTR, as soon as you inject it, the concentration becomes whatever the bulk concentration is. So ignore the CSTR part. So we'll say injection of a plug flow reactor for residence time tau. And uh, so if we take the Laplace transform of a Dirac delta function, um, this tells us that the frequency domain of an impulse input is just the number one. And so this concludes the different types of inputs we can have in our uh, models that we use in uh, process control or dynamic behavior, uh, as well as the different types of dynamic behavior we can observe. And so I hope you guys find this useful. Let me know if you have any questions. Thanks for watching.